a very professional fighter. 35-year-old Roman Carmison taking on 32-year-old Alex Bonima of Kinshasa Zaire. A two and a half inch height advantage for Carmison who lives here in the United States and does not expect to live in Russia again. Bonima lives in Memphis, Tennessee. They're equal in arm length, measured from the armpit to the end of the fist, and they both weighed in well under the 154 pound weight class. Limited, in fact, Carmison, notably light at 151 and three quarters despite his height of nearly six feet. Rules of the bout with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. Now, Roman Carmazon, Alex Bonima fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the unified rules that you see in your screen. Jim, real quick, the four criteria that the judges will use to score each individual round, clean punching, effective aggressiveness, ring generalship, and defense with a strong emphasis on clean, effective punching. Jim. And now let's go to ring announcer Michael Buffer for the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen from Madison Square Garden, the action continues, brought to you by Don King Productions and sponsored by Chirac Vodka, Papa John's Pizza, Down South Boxing, and Coleman for the cure, the fight to KO cancer. At ringside, the three judges, all from New York, scoring this bout are Don Ackerman, Billy Costello, and Wynn Kintz. Referee in charge of the action inside the ring, Johnny Callis. And now 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Intercontinental Super Welterweight Championship. Fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black and gold, official weight 153 pounds. Professional record 28 victories, including 14 knockouts, five defeats with two bouts even. Originally from Kinshasa Zaire, now fighting out of Memphis, Tennessee. The challenger, former WBA Continental America's champion, Alex, the technician, Bunema. And fighting out of the red corner, official weight, 151 three quarter pounds. He's wearing black and has a professional record consisting of 36 victories including 23 knockouts, only two defeats with one bout even. From Kuznetsk, Russia, the defending WBA Intercontinental Champion and former world champion, Roman Made in Hell Karmazin. Where are we getting the cue from? Alex, Roman, I gave you instructions in the dressing room. Protect yourself at all times. Above all, obey my commands at all times. First command is right now, touch gloves, touch them up. Come out fighting. Good luck to the both of you. Alex Bonima makes friends with New Yorkers by showing up in the ring with an Eli Manning New York Giants jersey. But Roman Carmison has dedicated this fight to two lesser known New Yorkers. And it's a great story. I'm gonna tell that story in the first round and I didn't have to wait, or didn't expect to have to wait 10 seconds for that bell to happen, but finally we're here. Roman Carmazan has never met the families of Russell Timoshenko, a New York City police officer, and Evgeny Marcelik, an auxiliary officer, but both of those men died in the line of duty last year. Timoshenko was an immigrant from, uh, from Belarus who came here at age of nine and ultimately made it onto the New York police force, and uh, Marcelik was five when he and his family, Russians, fled the war in Chechnya and came to the United States. Both uniformed officers who died here in New York this past year, and Carmison has dedicated his performance in this fight to them as a tribute to them, and of course to all New York City police officers. And this is a guy, because, because he's Russian, because he wasn't commercially saleable to a large degree in the United States, and because he's good, uh, that a lot of people may have, not necessarily ducked Emmanuel, but conveniently avoided 
uh, in the 154 pound weight class. Yeah, right? he's a very, very good fighter, tall, good amateur background. He said the reason he didn't get to participate in the Olympics was simply because he didn't couldn't get a sponsor, which was a big thing at that, at that time, which was someone to sponsor him to go to the Olympic trials held in Russia. In 1996, if he had yeah. had the uh, the force behind him, the sponsorship, as he says, to to represent Russia at the Olympic Games in 1996, he would have been in a field of boxers from Eastern Europe, many of whom became extremely well known. Vasily Chirov, Vladimir Klitschko, who won the Super Heavyweight Championship uh, at those games. There were several of them. Parmesan didn't get the chance because economic conditions in Russia at that time made it difficult for fighters to garner the support. The Federation was in tatters. There was no way for them to go if somebody would not pay their way. Of course, the Klitschko's but, but, never had to worry about that kind of thing. No, and Latimer in particular, he was what we call put into a program when he was 14 with gifted athletes. At the age of 14, they uh, put him in the program over there, and I guess it paid off. At the age of 20, he won the super heavyweight gold medal. Well, I, what I've always well, said is that Vladimir, even though he won that super heavyweight gold medal after the fall of the Iron Curtain, after the fall of the Soviet Union, he was really the last product off the Soviet sports machine assembly line. He was somebody who was groomed for his stardom at the Olympics from the time he was a little kid. And you know, when you were thinking about the amateur program, he's the last star heavyweight I see that has come from the amateur program, period, in the entire world, including the United States. Uh, since 96, we haven't had a really superstar quality fighter too much come out of the Olympics uh, into the heavyweight division. That's why it, it is what it is today. And to tie the whole story together, Parmesan is hoping, once his professional career is over, that he can go back to Russia and find three or four prospects like himself who need the opportunity and bring them over here. All right. Yeah, good. Okay. All right, he's just walking you down. He's looking, trying to set you up for the right hand. Yeah, no. Okay. Oh, hook, oh, hook. Yeah. He's trying to set you up for it. Okay. You gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta pick up the pace just a little bit. You're moving around. It's fine, but you gotta, gotta give him some more punches. Let him see something. Okay. Yeah. I know you're feeling him out this round, but now you gotta start putting some punches in his face. Okay. Because he's, he's getting comfortable now. Okay. Take your time, take your time. Keep, keep, keep the pressure. Now, be careful, don't follow him. Cut the ring off. Uh -huh. right. He's moving into your overhand right. Set it up. The fighters were polite enough to fight a relatively inactive first round while I took the time to tell the story of Carmison's dedication to the two slain New York City police officers, one of them born in Belarus and the other a Russian. Uh, and so CompuBox numbers, Carmison was 8 out of 36, Benima was 7 out of 26. Just for the sake of it, unofficially, let's say that the fight begins now, now that we've laid the groundwork with all of that storytelling. Incidentally, if you think you've seen Alex Benima before, maybe you were watching when he fought Jermaine Taylor on HBO. This was prior to Taylor's uh, title shot against Bernard Hopkins, a time when he was making his way up in the middleweight division, and he was doing so, as is often the case for fighters with big commercial images, he was doing so by harvesting smaller fighters coming up from 154 pounds and beating them at 160, and Bonima was one of those who had to face the wrath of Taylor when he was a bigger, stronger guy. Yes, and, it, and now Jermaine is fighting one of the biggest middleweights in middleweight history. And Kelly Pavlik. Kelly Pavlik. Yep. So now Jermaine gets a taste of the kind of medicine he was giving to people like Bonima before he... But listen, yeah. so many star fighters go through that. I mean, Oscar De La Hoya's whole early career was built on harvesting smaller fighters who came up to make the money they would make by fighting him. That's the business of boxing. Absolutely. Even though the first two rounds haven't produced a ton of action, you can see that Carmazan's length and particularly his long jab are going to create a tactical problem for Benima tonight. Yeah, and he, he should be a little bit more aggressive right now. You know, not that he has to come in uh, carelessly, but should, should pick up his jab more. He's fighting in spots, and that's going just against him because he needs to be more physical. He's a much, even though he may weigh less, he seems to be a much physically bigger man, and there's a lot of great amateur experience too. 
And I think he's the only Eastern European-born fighter, Emmanuel, whom I've ever seen fighting with his left hand below his waist like that. Yeah, he doesn't fight, strictly doesn't fight like uh, any of the European fighters He fights, fights in an American all. style. I mean, with his hand held down there, he could be in a gym in Detroit. <laughs> uh, anywhere. Or anywhere. And it's interesting, between fights, he say he always lives back in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia. He doesn't live in the United States. He just comes to train at Freddie Roach's gym when he gets ready for a fight. But he loves to be at Golden home Roman. in Russia with his family. The ubiquitous Freddie Roach, uh, trainer of so many star fighters, most notably, of course, Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao. Oscar Deloy on a one-night-only basis last year. Now there's considerable conversation about the possibility, it seems, of Deloy versus Floyd Mayweather a second time this year. Immediately bringing up the question, who will train Oscar step this back, time? Step back, step back, don't hit it all, step back. Carmison's one of the many fighters who figures into that as all of Freddie Roach's table is going to be watching and waiting to see if Freddie's going to once again go on higher for De La Hoya if the fight takes place. He's moving into it. That's the only thing I see is just keep the jab going a little bit because he's fine. He's still trying to set you up. But inside, you got to rip that fucking body up. Uh, jab's in his face. He yeah, don't do nothing. Yep. Yeah. Right. When you're throwing that jab, he's not doing nothing. Yeah, that's it. Three of Schedule 12 between Roman Karmazin, originally from Kutznesk, Russia, and Alex Bonima, originally Roman, from Kinshasa, Zaire. Alex, let go. Oh. You heard the little noise from Bonima in the ring, helping referee Roman, Eddie Claudio to know up. that Karmazin had landed one below the belt. Referee Johnny Callis. <laughs> Not Eddie Claudio. <laughs> Carmison's two losses were two entirely different kinds of fighters. He lost to no Javier Castillejo head, Roman. in Castillejo's home country of Spain. And he lost to St. Louis's Corey Spinks whose trainer, Kevin Cunningham, you just saw, training Devin the Great Alexander. And that is a loss that he would surely like to avenge. Place in 2006. Carmison's most prominent win was over Kasim Uma of Uganda. So he's hoping to go 2-0 and against the continent of Africa by beating Bonima tonight. In, in fact, his loss to Corey Spinks was in Corey Spinks' hometown also. So both of his losses were in his opponent's hometown. Let go of each other. Buema has not been throwing many punches, but it's, it's been interesting that he has landed several right-hand punches. 
right through the center as Carmesan is like right. pulling back all of the time and leaves that gap as he throws that wide hook. And, and Bohemian's right. land his right hand's right inside. Yeah, well, of Love course, Carmesan carries his left hand below his waist yeah. and, uh, and and invites you to land right hand. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the strategy of him throwing an overhand right when he has a guy that's already okay. bent over. That's okay. overhand right is usually going to guy straight up where you can catch it with his yes, head The up. uppercut would be the better idea. The uppercut would have been much better, or at least okay. a straight, short, straight right hand. No. Roman, he's trying to go under your hook. What's that look, I for, uh, look for the right uppercut. Know, but you're lunging when you're throwing that right hand to the head. When you lead with that right hand, you're still lunging in with it, okay? Take a step first and then throw that right hand. Okay, okay step first. And hey, keep these hands tight when you're in close. Yeah, I know. Okay? A step first and then the right hand, you'll hit him, okay? Mm -hmm. I heard him a little bit that round. I did. You did. You got his Take attention. Your time. You got his attention. Stay tight. Uh, of round four in the third round Alex Bonima as Emmanuel Stewart said landing more than Roman Carmison 20 out of 44 to Carmison's 13 out of 62 Harold how do you score through three hey, okay Jim two rounds to one 29 28 Roman Carmison Jim I gotta tell you Alex Bonima has put out a clinic and how to move your head I've never seen anything like this he bobs to the left he bobs to the right he bobs to the left he bobs to the right goes backwards and forwards I mean he's got a very herky jerky awkward style and he ain't easy to hit in the third round, he comes across the top with a right hand. Carmazon never saw it coming, and he nailed him real good. So I thought Benima won that third round after Carmazon shared them to death in rounds one and two. Two rounds to one, Carmazon. the subtle things that the layman might find hard to appreciate about boxing but absolutely vital and fundamental to the success of the fighter is head movement and head movement is not easy to learn it isn't necessarily a natural thing it comes from years of hard work and experience in the gym and probably the biggest thing to realize Emmanuel Stewart is that it isn't just that you have to move your head but you have to move it in an irregular pattern so that you can't be predicted yeah, so in your, time. Your opponent can't time you and, and, and punch it where he thinks you're going to be at. But generally, Carmazan doesn't move his head on at all. It's a stationary target all the time. And there are a lot of fighters like that. Yeah, and if a guy gets closer to him, look, a bigger guy probably is going to get closer to him before he shoots a straight right hand, he's going to have a problem. A fight right there is right there because he's very much open for right hands. Munima here has the opportunity for the first time in his career after years of being a very solid junior middleweight contender for the first time beating a guy who's considered an elite Alex guy in the division whenever Bunim has come up against the elite he's come up a little short well he said a lot of that was a tribute to the fact he never had proper sparring or training and he said for this fight he left, uh, went, left Memphis, I think he said he went to went Texas. To Dallas. Yeah, Texas, he trained good, so he's in shape for the first time in a long time in terms of good sparring. Yeah, he certainly had a better chance of finding an abundance of sparring partners in Dallas than, than would have been the case in Memphis, although, of course, there's a boxing culture that's growing in Memphis, a uh, promotional operation there that has made a commitment. Zab Judah is promoted out of Memphis, but uh, Zab Judah doesn't live and train in Memphis, so Manima went to Dallas looking for... A greater population of tall 154 pounders for getting ready to fight Roman Carmison. Okay, so, so same thing. Just keep the jab going. We got to start moving your head a little bit, okay? He hits you coming in with a right uppercut. Watch out for that right uppercut mm -hmm. when you come inside, okay? Yeah. So you come over the top with your right hands. And start trying to time his jab a little bit. The jab's coming in your face. You come oh. over, come over with the right hand. Okay. Okay. Good job. Nice job, guys. Steve. Sure, sure. Good idea. Good. 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 Good.
Nice uppercut. Nice uppercut. Body shot. Okay, that's what. That's that, that's what. Little little right hand. After the after the uppercut, come with the right hand. Okay. Not just not one punch. Okay. of a scheduled 12. 154 pound weight class. Two fighters looking to set themselves up to move toward title shots. Winner of the fight. Be in a good position. is always a little short most of the time with his right hand simply because he starts his right hand from too far away. But if he would get a little bit closer before he threw his right hand, I think he would have a very effective punch tonight. But he just is throwing it from a little too far out. It's really interesting to note how the 154-pound weight class has been a kind of feast or famine division for the last 10 years. There have been moments when you could look at the 154-pound rankings Roman and find fighters like Oscar De La Hoya, Shane Mosley, Fernando Vargas, Felix Trinidad, all fighting in the division at the same time. Then there are moments, a year or two later, or a year or two before, when you can look at the 154-pound rankings and find no world-class prominent fighters of that you know, ilk fighting in the division. Some of the guys went back to 47. You exactly. know what I think it is? Uh, it depended on where Oscar De La Hoya felt most comfortable fighting that year. <laughs> That's where the money was, and everyone seemed to follow. But Nima, though, is o old school in the sense that he hasn't fought those glittery names, but Michael Lerma, Carlos Bajorquez, J.C. Candelo, Tony Marshall, these good, solid junior middleweight contenders for years. He was winning most of the time against that level guy. All right, let's shift gears just for a moment here, Max. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to tell us a story about an interesting development which has taken place literally within the last 24 hours related to the wearing of gloves in the fight between Roy Jones and Felix Trinidad. What's up? There was a bit of a glove controversy. Roy Jones found out today that in the contract for the fight, it stipulated he had to wear Everlast gloves, not the Grant gloves, which were color-coordinated to his outfit and are considered more puncher's gloves than Everlast, although nowadays that's even changing a little bit in terms of which glove is the puncher's glove. But anyway, about 10 minutes, he tried to negotiate with the Trinidads to allow him to wear Grant gloves. They said no, and so here's an unusual scene just about 10 minutes ago. Usually you pick out gloves a day or two before the fight. Here's Papa Trinidad and Coach Merkerson to the left picking out the gloves, you know, an hour before the fight. Under the stipulation of the New York State Athletic Commission that both fighters had to choose Everlast gloves from that table. Is it true that Roy Jones actually went to the hotel room of Tito, Tito Trinidad today to try to persuade Trinidad to let him wear Grant gloves? That I do not know. I asked someone in Trinidad's camp if that were the case. They said no. Uh, I asked Roy Jones about the gloves. He said yes, he wanted them to be changed. I did not ask if he went to the hotel room. But I've seen an email which was sent from Roy Jones to another party. And that email seemed to suggest that he had actually gone to the room of Felix Trinidad to try to persuade Felix and his father to let him vary the contract and wear Grant gloves in the fight. He, he certainly did ask to vary the contract and was denied. Whether that was, and it sounds like it was in person, whether that was at the hotel room, Jim, I blew it. I needed to ask him that question, didn't Well, we'll I? find out as the evening goes on. But Emmanuel Stewart, in your long experience, do you know of any situation you've known of in the past where two fighters for a fight of this magnitude had personal contact with each other in a hotel room, had conversation with each other, might have even been an argument right. on the, the day back, of the fight? The I have never, never, never heard of that. 
But, you know, Roy has always fought his whole career for the most part in soccer room in recent years with Grant Gloves, and he's really one of the biggest, you know, advocates of having Grant Gloves when he fights. And so having used to having his way with most things, I can see why it would be a psychologically uh, upsetting situation for him to have to wear Everlast gloves. And in the glove hierarchy, as Max referred to the question of what's a puncher's glove, in the glove hierarchy, Reyes, Everlast, Grant, the three biggest brands that are used by star punch, fighters, punch, break, which one would back. you say is the puncher's glove and which one is the pillow? Max pointed out a good thing that used to be what we would consider Everlast was usually a horse hair. They was considered the softer gloves and you punch better with the, the Reyes gloves because they had a little more harder foam, but that's changed. In fact, I've had so many different type of Everlast gloves, I mean, and they all have different shapes. So you really can't well, say that push. anymore. They, they, all of them are different. It's what you have your most comfortable grip. But the ones that most of the fighters seem to like a lot is their premium glove is the Grant gloves recently. They say they feel more comfortable and uh, a little wider inside and their hands are not as squeezed up. It seems to me Jones is more concerned about the color coordination than how the gloves I, I, would, I would say so in that case. But no, he's very adamant about those Grant gloves. I take that back. He's well, and 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 it's a it's a long relationship, and and Grant gloves really represents one person who has been their disciple to the sport, who has really created the glove and brought it to fighters. And surely Roy is friends with that person. Yeah, His name yeah, is Elvis. Elvis. Elvis is very personal. Elvis Grant, all right? All of the fighters talking to him. I can make the gloves match your outfit. I do. He's the hardest working salesman I think it is for selling his products out here in, in the sport. And but Everlast still is, is the dominant glove that you're going to see most places, and they make a very good glove. And there's so many different types and styles that they have now. You can almost choose which one you want. Well, after this round is over, we'll show you Max's interview with Roy Jones, uh, in which they discussed this subject. And you know, you'll get a sense, you'll get a little bit of a feel for exactly how upset Roy might be over having been forced to live up to the, the terms of the contract and wear Everlast gloves. Anima with a lively finish to this round. And a uh, short time ago, Max Kellerman spoke to Roy Jones. Roy, um, we've heard rumors today that uh, you were upset at the fact that the contract calls for Everlast gloves, not Grant gloves that you wanted to wear. Can you talk about that? It's simple. Your boy be trying to look good. Gray and red. You know I'm a teak now. I'm looking out for my folks. Gray and red. You know what I'm saying? Grant gloves. Green and red. I just be trying to look good for my fans. That's all I'm about. If you want to fight, we can go fight in a pair of hardware gloves from Eckers. I don't care. I can go to the hardware store and get a pair of gloves and fight anything they want to fight. It really don't make me no difference. You know what I'm saying? I was just, you know, trying to stay loyal to what I do. I like to look good for my people. I was still looking good like this, but since he wanted, I'll take them everlasting, put an everlasting whipping on that he won't never forget. Uh, were you not aware it was in the contract that you that it was stipulated that you wore everlasting, not Grant? I wasn't aware right away, and um, you know when they told me, they said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll work with that. Let's just put the fight together. I said, you know what? Okay, we'll put the fight together, and we'll work with that. So I was trying to be a cool guy. I mean, I wasn't mad because he was 170.2 yesterday. I was like, you know what? Let that .2 fly. I ain't tri tripping on no .2 tenths of a pound. But you know, everything got to be their way, and you know what? It's cool. It's just that we ain't going to let them put that cast on now. We done. You say their way, uh, Papa Trinidad? That's the problem. I wish I knew he was going to be talking so much. I'd have bought my own daddy called Cole Merkin, a little big fun, but my daddy probably a little big fun too. But I wish I knew he was going to be talking so much. I'd have found somebody his size and some color. We took care of that too, but it's all good. <laughs> How's that for an undercard? Jim? Well, th there's the direct reference. When he says, I wish I had known Papa Trinidad was going to be talking so much, that is a reference to the meeting that took place in the hotel room and which I saw referred to in an email uh, earlier today. You'd think, although I never asked the question directly, did you physically go to the hotel room? So I don't he know the answer. He made the point right there. And I, and I know from what I saw in the email, he's referring to the conversation he had with Tito and Papa this afternoon. All right, let's go back to the business at hand, which is round seven between Roman Carmison and Alex Bonima. Harold, how do you have it through six? Okay, Jim, four rounds to two, 58. 56, Roman Carmesa. I thought Benima pulled that rounds two and rounds four, landing nice right hands. But he's not doing enough. He's really right. not throwing enough shots. Back, he's got to throw that right hand more often. Carmesa doing a nice job with that left hand and occasional right hands. You know, the, le the left jab, the left hook, and the occasional right hand. He's forcing the action, landing the better shots for the Duke Carmesa. Now, just a brief return to the glove story. 
You heard Roy Jones refer to the cast. Teak. Go ahead. Well, uh, so before we get to the cast, the cast yes. okay, I want to get to that. Before we get to the cast, he referred to Teak, which is a national fraternity named Tau Cap Epsilon, of whom or of which he's a member. That was the reference there. The red and gray are the colors of that fraternity. That was part of his desire to wear the gloves. What about the cast, Emmanuel? You know, he said something about the cast, and I think he's referring to uh, the fact that a lot of the boxers have complained uh, about the way that Tito uh, Trinidad's father wraps his hand. You remember Bernard Hopkins made him actually take the hand wrap off and rewrap it because they say that he uses excessively amount of gauze and tape to the point where when he gets through it's like a hardened cast. And that's what he said he's more concerned about that than he is about the gloves at this stage, even though he's upset about the gloves. And the, the effect of the, uh, the, the extra wrapping and the supposed hard cast inside the glove is to aid the power punching of the Going power punching like, Trinidad, right? Like that's, right that's right. You notice when we was asking Trinidad yesterday, he said, I've never had any hand problems in my entire career. He's the only yeah. hard oh. puncher I've oh, ever heard say that. <laughs> and I have to attribute to Coincidental or not. Yes. <laughs> Lots of layers to this glove thing, but in the end, how much difference does it really make, Emmanuel? I don't think it's going to make any difference. So. Well, one difference it made is that it filled about a round and a half for us. <laughs> in the Roman Carmazon versus Alex Benima fight. <laughs> now Max Kellerman with Felix Tito Trinidad. Tito, um, Roy seemed a bit upset that he had to wear Everlast gloves rather than the Grant gloves that he wanted to wear, especially since he let the fact that you were a little bit over the weight yesterday slide. Why not let him use the Grant gloves? Bueno, es algo que ya se había eh, programado, o sea, ya estaba firmado un contrato. Los guantes van a ser Everlast. Desde hace mucho tiempo se había programado Everlast. Well, it was agreed, it was signed for in the contract that Everlast gloves were the ones to fight with, and that was signed for. Um, Roy made a comment uh, afterward saying that um, that given your father's response to the situation, he wished he brought his dad and uh, you could have a double Jones Trinidad uh, fight tonight, essentially. <laughs> your response. Well, I think I'm going to take care of that. I'll take care of that. Well, I'll take care of that. I'll hit him in my father's name. Um, Given that, even though it was in the contract uh, that you were supposed to use Everlast, given that he did let it slide that you were a little bit o above the weight, that he was willing to do it, is the fact that you won't let him use Grant, is this a psychological advantage you're trying to gain, or do you really believe that wearing Everlast is going to help you in the fight? Bueno, es que es algo que nosotros habíamos decidido. Me gusta el guante Everlast y el peso. El peso, está, el peso estuvo muy bien, 170.0. No, 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 one final observation. I'm looking at that interview, Emmanuel, and I'm thinking about the tremendous relationship between Trinidad and fans, not just Puerto Rican fans, but fans of boxing have always loved him. And I'm reminded that one small reason may be that Felix Trinidad's natural expression is a playful smile. It's always, you know, and I've never met any fight in my life that has so much of a high spirit and warmness when you see him in the crowd with the people, and he loves the excitement. and. Right creates a lot of a, uh, warmth and uh, excitement whenever he walks into a room. And I think, and he feeds on that, in particular his crowd. And, a, and an interesting it. contrast, which goes to his relationship with Puerto Rican fans, an interesting contrast is Miguel Cotto. I know where who you're is going. By, yeah. Who is, is stone-faced in, yeah. in comparison to uh, Trinidad. Very good fighter, but uh, just two different personalities. But uh, I would say high-spirited, high-energy, bubbling over with excitement, Trinidad. Trinidad every time. Especially when you consider complete Miguel opposites. Cotto fights in a similar style to Trinidad in that he's aggressive, he's always looking to force the action, make the fight. Um, it does seem like the best explanation for why he hasn't gotten quite the attention 
or at least the affection of the Puerto Rican people that Trinidad has, though it's he had affection. plenty of affection. It's the affection I'm thinking of here because a friend of mine who's a print reporter went out on the street to the ticket line and asked a half dozen Puerto Rican fans who were buying tickets if you could come here later this year to watch Felix Trinidad coming off of a victory or Miguel Cotto fighting one of the best fighters in the sport, which ticket do you buy? And the unanimous answer was Trinidad. Unanimous. I find that remarkable. That's very interesting, especially that Cotto is such a great fighter and has been in so many great fights. He's, he's actually placed Trinidad in terms of being an exciting Puerto Rican fighter, but they still love Tito. Meanwhile, we still love Roman Carmazan and Alex Bonima, regardless <laughs> of how little we've spoken of them these past three rounds. And the next, in the next you, round, we'll bring, bring you back up to date on what's Way happening to keep in the that fight. Jab working and shoot the right hand down there. Beautiful. What Beautiful. happens if you keep it going backwards right there? You heard him that round, Alex. Suck my hand. You hurt that motherfucker, my okay? Neck. Yeah. Neck, no, my face, man. <laughs> not the my head, back of his right head. Here. My no. neck. My neck. Okay, you use it. Beautiful round. Just keep doing what you're doing. Towel, towel. Towel. Hey, Roman. What's your wrong? Let's work again that jab, okay? Robote, Zaji Jabba. Work that right hook to the body. You saw him right, right hook to the body. Back to the left hook to the head. Uh-huh. Okay. Because he's moving into your right when hand. Okay. You stop him with the hook and then you finish him with the hook, okay? okay. Body, head. Copy box numbers in round eight. Karma's an 11 out of 56. Benima 18 out of 49 with a 9-3 edge in Power Connects. You heard Benima's trainer, Bill Samrall, saying to his fighter that he hurt the opponent, Karmazan, in the last round. And, uh... See that Harold Letterman agreed with Samuel, and the score has tightened just a little bit on the Letterman scorecard. I felt the same way. We were talking at the time, but I, I thought that I saw him hurt uh, Carmazon. In fact, Carmazon, even though he's fighting a good fight, he's not even really impressing me tonight at all. His vulnerability for right hands is just is, is unusual, and all he had to do is just keep doing just what he's doing there, jab, jab, and shoot left uppercuts and, and, and short, straight right hands. But he, he doesn't seem to avoid right hands when they're thrown at him. He also doesn't, you know, we just saw Alexander, um, the junior welterweight prospect come contender, and uh, he fights with a certain intensity. He's inspired. It's inspiring watching him. Later, we have Mike Malo, the heavyweight, against Andrew Galata, and Malo can be inspiring when he fights, and that's just not Karmazan's style or Bunima's style. They're workmanlike, they're, they're world-class, but they're not inspired fighters. Well, back in the days when cultural stereotypes were more firmly set in stone, you know, you might have said, show me an Eastern European athlete with identifiable fire and emotion, and I'll show you a creature you haven't seen before. Now, we've seen a lot more of them in recent years as, of course, global culture has replaced national cultures. Uh, but nevertheless, it was an expectation for a long time that if you were... If you were dealing with an Eastern European, regardless of the sport, you were dealing with a cold clinical technician. Somebody who knew how to do it. Meanwhile, Bunima hurt Karmazan. Again, yeah, again he's, he's hurting him, and it doesn't seem like they're great shots, but they're doing it. I think Karmazan, maybe the weight or whatever, he's coming in so light to be so tall, he may not be able to take that good a punch at that weight also. At 35 years old, too, yeah, he, he may be draining through the hourglass a little bit. Yes, and he has no defense for right hands at all, though. Really. And he's in there with a real guy. So Benima's in the fight, and he hits Karmazan across the top with another hard right hand. Karmazan tries to come back with body shots. Good body combination by Karmazan there. Benima seems to have gotten his attention, as just in the last minute or so, while we're talking about it, Karmazan's energy level has gone up. When he starts putting punches together, he's a beautiful fighter to watch when he gets away from his tech to the chess game style of fighting. what Karmazan gains by holding his left hand below the waist. Unless you're going to use the freedom and the flexibility to really fire a searing laser jab from there, I'm not sure what the advantage is. And he doesn't do it.
glamour at Madison Square Garden, world's most glamorous arena. He obviously hasn't been following the Knicks this year, Jim. Coming to her first Knicks game next week, Max. <laughs> Here you see Bonema land the right hand, which has been his most effective punch tonight. Continuing, in fact, that's his, really the only punch he's doing any damage with. The problem is he doesn't throw it often enough. Seconds out. Power shots through nine. Carmison 52 out of 207. Bonima 66 out of 135. So Alex Bonima is landing more power shots and landing at a significantly higher connect percentage. No, no, Harold, no, how do you have no. it coming to the tent? Okay, Jim, 86, 85, five rounds to four. Yeah. Roman Carmison. Jim, I gotta tell you, Alex Bonima, just like Emmanuel said, is strictly a right hand puncher. I mean, you know when he lands because, oh! oh with a left and hook. he knocks Carmison down with a left, left hook. hook. <laughs> <laughs> you Way to go, Harold. It. Way to go. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, we're all experts at this table, right? <laughs> you know, you know, guys, in, in a career where he's come up a little short against the elite, here Bunima has a real shot to beat a real-name guy in the division. He sure does. And can he seize the moment? Well, and, and uh, for Carmazan's part, how much does he have left at age 35 in a career which has taken him close but to it, real prominence? It looks weak in his legs. That's what I'm looking at. Even though he's doing things very effective, but his legs, Carmazan's legs look so weak. And keep in mind, that knockdown came at a point at which Parmesan was still leading by one point on Harold Letterman's scorecard. That is and a hit right hand with a right hand and, and eats another left hook. That's and that it's right hand over. will end the fight. There is no yeah. way Roman Parmesan makes it back up from that. Yeah. And the doctor is already with no. him. A tremendous knockout victory yeah. for Alex Bonima. <laughs> Didn't come up short this time. Yeah. <laughs> Great fun to watch Alex Bonima celebrate the biggest moment of his career. And guys, we turned our attention back to the fight at the right moment. That's trainer Bill Samroll, elated for his fighter. And now Benima will replace Karmazin, in effect, in the 154-pound hierarchy, and will look for a fight with Corey Spinks or other top fighters in the division. It's very nice to see a guy like Bunima in this situation. He's earned it. There's the left hook. Probably the first he threw. <laughs> and you but, I mean, that's right. You've been talking about him throwing nothing but the right but, hand all night, and but, boom. But his right hand was right on the money. And as the fight uh, got closer and, and Carmazan tired a little bit, then he was able to get better range and land the right hands that before they was always short. Never been knocked out before and was knocked out instantly when that punch landed. The way Carmazan hit the canvas on this right hand, you just knew he was not getting up to beat a 10 count. A huge victory for Alex Benima. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the official particular. Ladies and gentlemen, the end comes at one minute. 24 seconds of round number 10. The winner by TKO victory. And now the new WBA Intercontinental Champion, Alex, the technician, Benima. Lift me up, lift me up.